Hello good people and welcome back into another parry this video. Today we are once again diving into a topic of Arthurian legend and history. Today's focus will be on the original Grail Knight, Sir Percival. I will mostly focus on the attributes and actions from the many legends, but I will also tell you what I know about the possible historical basis for this figure. So let's dive on in and get to know Sir Percival the Innocent. Sir Percival, also called Sir Percival, Sir Parsifal, and Sir Parzival, or in Welsh, Peridur, was among the most famous of King Arthur's Knights of the Round table. We can, with 100% surety, trace Percival's origins back to Percival, the story of the Grail, by Chrétien de Troyes. But, through historical research and disambiguation, we can likely link the same character to far older Welsh tales and legends. However, this character is most famous and well known for being the original hero in the quest for the Holy Grail. He would later, in some stories, be replaced by Sir Galahad in this story. But we will not discuss much of that today. Since I want to start as early as I can in this telling, we will be begin with the possible historical origin of this character. The historical Percival is theorized to be Peridur, the Steel Arms, the eldest son of King Elifer Gosgordfar. This man is said to have a twin brother, named Gwergi, and the two of them are said to have founded the town of Pickering, and to have been the joint kings of Abrock. The Welsh tradition states that Peridur and Gwergi were brought up by their mother after their father was murdered when the boys were young. It is then widely accepted that Peridur would dedicate much of his life to avenging his father. Peridur of Ebrock is best known for his victory over King Gwendolu of Caer Wendelu, otherwise known as Carwinli, at the Battle of Arfderid, now known as Arthuret in Cumbria. In the year 573 AD, the Yorkist kings allied themselves with King Ridark, Hale of Strathclyde, and possibly King Dunoutbur of the Northern Pennines. Peridur and Gwergi, who were joint kings, would march north to claim the disputed land of Caer Laverock from King Gwendolu. The king of Caer Wendelu was killed in the ensuing battle, and his bard, Myrdin, later known as Merlin, who was one of the few survivors, fled into the Caledonian forest. Peridur was unfortunately able to take full advantage of his victory, and was forced to return home. Then, seven years later, he marched north again with his army, this time to put down the Anglians of Bernicia, and both he and his brother would be killed by King Adda's forces at Caer Gru. The Dirans then rose up under King Ela and moved against the city of Ela. Brock, forcing Peridur's son to flee the kingdom for his life. And that is the full story, or at least what we can pretty much verify, of the real-life Percival. As for the legend of this character, I will be compiling the most important events from each various telling that lie consistently with each other. If and when we run into any contradicting points, I will stop to discuss them. But the story of Percival is actually decently clear, at least for Arthurian legend. The birth and lineage of Percival is disputed, but nearly all tellings share a common theme. It is likely that Percival was of noble blood blood, but nonetheless received a humble upbringing. His father is most often Aelin Le Gros, King Pelinor, or some other worthy knight. In some modern retellings, he is meant to have fully common birth, but these do not fit in with the traditional legend, and should therefore be discounted offhand. If we suppose that his father is King Pelinor, as many tales would have us believe, that would make Eglavale, Lamorak, and Dornar his brothers, as well as Tor his half-brother. It is also most common that Percival has a sister named Dindrain. In any case, after the death, or sometimes the disappearance of his father, Percival's mother would take him to live with her in the forest, where she would raise him in innocence, not knowing the ways of men until the age of 15. It is generally accepted that her motives for doing this were as a result of losing her husband when he died, and her other sons who had all left in search of knighthood and adventure. It was this reasoning that caused her to attempt to keep Percival from the life of chivalry. However, at the age of 15, a group of knights would pass through the forest, and Percival would be totally taken by their manner and bearing. He would be inspired by them, and this would awaken in him a desire to seek out Arthur's court, and to become a knight himself. In many stories, learning that her son was leaving to become a knight, Percival's mother would weep and fall into sullen silence. In others, she would die of grief, but in most, she would simply faint and recover herself later. In any case, she does not want him to leave, but cannot and does not restrain him from doing so. Percival's first adventure would arrive quickly enough. See, when he left home, his mother had given him some simple instructions. She instructed him that he must pray in a chapel. Note, he had never been in a church before, as well as how to treat a lady with respect and to be courteous. She told Percival that a, a knight who wins a lady's love would receive a kiss and a ring, and this would bring the knight great honor. Of course, being rather simple and uneducated, these instructions were lost on the young Percival. Later that day, he would come across a large tent, and mistaking it for a church, would enter it. Inside, he found a damsel, and misinterpreting his mother's instructions, would forcibly kiss her and take a ring from her finger. Then he helped himself to some food that was there, and left, as the damsel, likely confused and afraid, sobbed. Soon 
soon after the damsel's lover would arrive. This man is most often known as simply the haughty knight of the heath. He would blame the damsel, saying that she had seduced a stranger, and he would vow to find and cut off the head of the young Percival. Percival would continue on to Camelot, and would arrive at Arthur's court, where he would see the Red Knight of Quincaroy, who had taken the king's golden cup. No knight at King Arthur's court had the courage to retrieve the cup, as the knight was said to be a powerful and dangerous warrior, who had apparently already wounded many of the knights of King Arthur. Percival would come before King Arthur, where he would demand to be knighted and given red armor like that of the Red Knight. Of course, this would not go over all too well, and Sir Kay, Arthur's seneschal, would sarcastically tell Percival that the red armor belongs to the Red Knight, and that he would have to take it from him. Not realizing that this was a cruel joke, Percival immediately went off after the Red Knight. While leaving Arthur's Hall, Percival would interact with one of Queen Guinevere's ladies-in-waiting. She would laugh when she saw him, and proclaim that he will become one of Arthur's greatest knights. This was especially significant since this lady had reportedly not laughed in over six years. The suggestion that Percival would become a great knight upset Sir Kay, and in his jealousy, he would slap the lady-in-waiting in the face, and kick King Arthur's court fool. Percival, upon encountering the Red Knight, would demand that he remove his armor and give it to him by order of the king. The Red Knight would respond by attacking the unarmed and unarmored boy. Percival would avoid his blows and retrieve one of the Red Knight's javelins from nearby, and would throw it at the knight, striking him in the throat and killing him. Percival would then claim the Red Knight's armor and weapons for himself, and putting the armor on, he took the king's golden cup and handed it to a squire, with instructions to return it to the king, Arthur, along with a message that he would avenge the lady whom Sir Kay had slapped. King Arthur's court jester then foretold that the nameless new knight would avenge the lady and himself upon Sir Kay by breaking arm and shoulder blade. Percival would then leave Arthur's court with the intention of returning home to his mother, but he did not know the way. While wandering, Percival would meet Lord Gornamant of Gohort, who offered him lodging and would teach him all about courtly manners and would train Percival, honing his skills with knightly weapons and how to properly wear, use, and maintain his arms and armor. He also gave him a great deal of advice, including instructions to not talk too much or to ask too many questions of his host. This advice was meant to prevent Percival from being perceived as rude or as a fool, but it would have far more unfortunate consequences that were as of yet unforeseen. Percival would leave Gornament, and in his travels would find lodging at Biao Repair Castle, which belonged to Lady Blanche Floor. At this time, the castle was besieged by Lord Clamondow's army. Clamondow was attempting to take the land from Lady Blanche Floor and force her to marry him, as she was quite beautiful. Unfortunately, by the time Percival would arrive, most of Lady Blanche Floor's men were already captives of Lord Clamondow. Percival offered the lady his help, and in return, Lady Blanche Floor offered Percival her undying love and her lands to rule. Percival would challenge and defeat Clamondow's seneschal and Gwingaron in single combat. He would spare the seneschal under the agreement that he would return to Arthur's court as Arthur's prisoner. Percival instructed the defeated knight to carry a message that the lady whom Sir Kay had slapped would soon be avenged, and Gwingaron agreed and did thus. At this time, no one in King Arthur's court yet knew his name, but referred to him simply as the Red Knight. Hearing of the mysterious knight's adventures, King Arthur wished him to join his court. A few days after defeating Anguingaron, Percival would challenge and defeat Lord Clamondow in single combat. He would spare him under the same circumstances. Clamondow became a prisoner of King Arthur and carried a message to his court that the Red Knight would soon avenge the lady whom Sir Kay had slapped. Both of these knights would be freed by King Arthur and would become members of the Fellowship of the Round Table. Percival would stay with Blanche Floor, marrying her and fathering a son who would be named Lohengrin, and would be known as either the Black Knight or as the Knight of the Swan. After some time, he would decide to leave to seek his mother, and promise to return with her. In his travels, searching for his home, Percival would encounter a man fishing in a river. This man was crippled, and Percival offered to help him. The man then revealed that he was the lord of the nearby castle, and invited Percival to stay with him. Percival agreed, and went with the fisher into his castle. The crippled lord would gift him a magnificent sword. During his stay at the castle, Percival would witness several strange processions taking place. First, there was a squire who was carrying a bleeding lance, passing by Percival and his host to the next room. Then, two more squires followed, each carrying a candelabra. Then came a maiden who was carrying a grail. The grail illuminated the entire room far more brightly than all of the other candles combined. Lastly, came another maiden carrying a silver carving platter. Percival was, of course, very curious, mostly about the bleeding lance and the grail. But not wanting to be rude or to be thought a fool, he did not ask his host about them, instead deciding to ask a servant. The next day, Percival awoke to find the entire castle empty and deserted, so he got dressed, armed himself, and rode out of the castle. The moment he passed over the drawbridge, it raised behind him, and no matter how much he shouted, no sign of anyone appeared, and he could not get back in. As Percival rode away, 
the castle disappeared. He did not get far when he discovered a weeping maiden crying over the corpse of a headless knight, who had been killed by the haughty knight of the heath. Percival tried to comfort the girl. Percival discovered that the castle belonged to the Fisher King. The girl recognized the sword that the Fisher King had given to Percival. She warned him that the sword would break if he used it, and that a man named Trabuchet, who lived beside a lake beyond Cotuatra, was the only smith who could repair the sword. When the maiden learned that Percival had not asked questions about why the lance bled, or who was served from the grail, she became distressed. Had Percival asked these questions, the Fisher King would have been healed, and the devastated land surrounding the castle would have been restored. This maiden was, in fact, Percival's cousin, and she revealed to Percival that his mother had died of grief shortly after he had left her. Percival then left the maiden, promising to avenge her fallen knight. As Percival sought to avenge the headless knight, he encountered the same damsel that he had met earlier in the tent, only she was clad in a tattered cloth that barely hid her nakedness. She warned Percival that her jealous lover, the haughty knight, would kill anyone that tried to help her. And this is how the headless knight, the lover of Percival's cousin, had died. Percival would persist in helping her, and would meet with the haughty knight. The two would face each other in single combat, where Percival would of course win. He would then spare the haughty knight under the usual agreement, that he would become a prisoner of King Arthur, and would deliver his message that he would soon avenge the lady whom Kay had slapped. He would also inform the haughty knight that he had acted without the maiden's consent in the tent, and that she had committed no wrongdoing. The couple would then be reconciled, and the haughty knight would apologize for his jealousy. After receiving his most recent prisoner, King Arthur would send out Sir Sagramore, Sir Kay, and Sir Gawain to bring the Red Knight to his court to become a Knight of the Round Table. Unwittingly, they would come across him one morning while he was musing of how the blood on the snow from a wounded goose resembled the blush of a fair maiden. Sir Sagramore would ask that he accompany them to Camelot, and would mistake Percival's musing for deliberately ignoring him, and would of course be insulted. Sagramore would be offended and would attack Percival, but would be easily unhorsed by Percival. Sir Kay would then attack Percival, as he had vowed to bring him back by force if necessary. Of course, Percival would also easily unhorse him, driving him to the ground and breaking both his arm and his shoulder blade, thus fulfilling the jester's prediction. In the end, it was Sir Gawain who would bring Percival to King Arthur's court. Without fighting, the two would meet and would quickly become great friends, and Percival would return to Camelot with Gawain gladly. King Arthur would be delighted to meet him and would knight Percival on the spot, making him a member of his round table. A celebration would be held immediately, but it would be quickly interrupted as an incredibly ugly woman riding a mule would ride into the court. The woman would then rebuke Percival for not asking the questions that would have healed the Fisher King and his lands. She told him that immeasurable suffering would befall Britain for his silence. So Sir Percival would vow to once again find the castle and fix his mistake. Sir Percival would spend five years wandering the countryside looking for the castle. One day he would meet a hermit, who would turn out to be his uncle. He would learn that his mother was the hermit's sister and that they were both siblings of the Fisher King. The hermit was aware of his misadventures at the Grail Castle, and informed Sir Percival that by not asking about the lance and the grail, he had sinned against his host, but more importantly, God, and that before he could find the castle again, he would need to repent for these sins. Percival would stay for some time with his uncle, the hermit, repenting of his sins and renewing his faith in his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Renewed in his faith, Sir Percival would once again set out on a quest to seek the Fisher King's castle. In earlier tales, this would be on his own, and later it would be with Sir Bors in pursuit of Sir Galahad, and all three of them would achieve the quest for the Holy Grail with varying degrees of success. We will focus primarily on the earlier tellings, as all but two tellings of the Grail quest feature Sir Percival as the primary hero as opposed to Sir Galahad. On his travels, Percival would encounter a wounded 400-year-old knight named Sir Evelake, who in the days of Joseph of Arimathea had asked God not to die until he had seen the knight who would achieve the Grail quest. The Lord granted his request and promised when Sir Evelake saw the Grail knight he would at last be healed. Upon meeting Percival, Sir Evelake is healed of his wounds and then peacefully passes into eternity. As Sir Percival continues his journey, he is attacked by 20 knights who manage to kill his horse. He manages to fight them off and defeat them with the help of another knight. In many older tales, this knight is, of course, Sir Gawain, and in the new tradition, it is Sir Galahad, who then rides off again, leaving Sir Percival on his own. We are going to stick with the original tale and say that it was Sir Gawain who aided him, and then left after Sir Percival insisted that he must continue the quest on his own. Percival then then walks into the forest alone, where he meets a lone squire, who gifts Percival with a poor hackney. Then, shortly thereafter, meets with another man on a black horse, who scornfully kills the hackney and rides off. Then, a lady appears to Percival and gifts him with a black horse in return for his services. Percival mounts the horse and is shocked as it runs the distance of four days' journey in an hour, and is about to plunge them both into the sea when Sir Percival does the sign of the cross and breaks the horse's demonic power. It throws Percival off and jumps flaming and
and screaming into the sea. Next, Sir Percival comes across a lion fighting a serpent. He takes the part of the lion and helps it to slay the serpent, since the lion is the nobler beast. That night, in a dream, the lady who owns the lion praises him and the lady of the serpent demands that, in payment for her pet, he become her man. He refuses. A holy man comes to him on a white ship and explains the allegory. The lady of the lion is the new law. Faith, hope, belief, and baptism. The lady of the serpent is the old law, served by fiends, the black horse and the serpent, and her request that he be her man was a temptation. The holy man departs, then the black ship comes. A beautiful maiden lies to Percival, gets him drunk, and lies naked with him in a splendid pavilion. Percival, realizing what was happening, performs the sign of the cross, and the pavilion and the lady vanish. The holy man returns, explains that the lady was actually the devil himself, and that henceforth he must be more careful. The holy man vanishes, and Percival boards his ship and leaves that place. Percival's ship would travel for days outside of Percival's control. When at last it came out of the mists and stopped, Percival was outside the castle that he had been seeking, on the day of Pentecost. This castle was of course the Castle Corbinet, the seat of the Grail Kings, who had been entrusted with the protection of the Sacred Spear and the Sangral, or Holy Grail. This castle and family had existed for nearly 400 years, and the Fisher King was the descendant of Joseph of Arimathea, who had brought the sacred artifacts to Britain to protect them, and for centuries, he and his descendants had done just that. They were granted guardianship of the castle, the surrounding lands, and the artifacts by God under the conditions that each guardian lived a life of purity in deed and thought, dedicated to the veneration of Jesus Christ. However, over time, one of the guardians allowed his moral standards to slip, and was wounded in the groin by the sacred spear, causing him eternal suffering and making him unable to bear offspring. And, as the fertility of the land was linked to the king, the kingdom withered and died, becoming a barren wasteland until the time came when he would be healed by the purest knight in the world. Percival rode into the castle and went straight to the Lord's Hall, where a feast was in progress. Upon entering the hall, he saw that the seat to the right hand of the Fisher King was once again open, and he was ushered to it. Again, the strange procession began, and when Sir Percival witnessed the bleeding lance and the grail that illuminated the entire room, he was filled with wonder, and immediately asked the Fisher King why the lance appeared to bleed, and who could drink from such a bright grail. The Fisher King retold the story of the Last Supper and Christ's crucifixion, explaining that the chalice was the cup that Christ drank from at the Last Supper, and that the lance was the spear that Longinus had thrust into Christ's side upon the cross. Filled with amazement, Sir Percival beheld the items in their true light, and was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Fisher King was healed, and accepted into the Kingdom of Heaven. Sir Percival became the new guardian of Castle Corbinic and the Sacred Artifacts. The scales would fall from Sir Percival's eyes, and he would recognize the Grail Maiden as his sister, Dindrain. His wife, the Lady Blanchefleur, would join him, and together they remain the guardians of the castle, Longinus's spear, and the Holy Grail, until the time that King Arthur and his knights will ride forth from Avalon when Britain needs them most.